The world of energy is changing dramatically. Governments around the world have taken a very serious approach toward dealing with climate change. Primarily, this is focused on mitigating greenhouse gas emissions, CO2, which brings into focus fossil fuels because the combustion of fossil fuels is the principal emitter of CO2 that is man-made. Our energy system and the climate are in conflict. You either cope with that and deal with worse weather or you change your energy system. And that's a difficult and quite daunting thing to think about. The last time we went through a major sort of policy shift in the energy landscape was probably on the heels of the Arab oil embargo. It was a big move, particularly in Western societies that are import oriented, to reduce dependence on oil. That steam built. It got an additional kick, if you will, as oil prices and energy prices generally spiked as we went from 2003 to 2008. A lot of that was motivated by very rapid demand growth in Asia, particularly in China. China, India, South Korea, Taiwan, Thailand, and now it's moving to Vietnam, Pakistan, Bangladesh. A lot of these countries have massive domestic reserves of coal, and that was their first choice. You're talking about delivering energy services in a reliable way to a massive fraction of the world's population that has never really had it before to feed industrialization, economic activity. When we start thinking about these new innovative ways of addressing concerns related to climate and the energy mix, it is complicated in a significant way by the scale of the problem. For us in the developed world, we've got the luxury of trying to pick and choose now between sources of energy and technologies. So the developing world is not in that situation. So their first order is to supply enough energy and electricity to their people. Beyond just access to electricity, you're trying to catch up with growing demand. So you can't shut down any of your inefficient pre-existing fossil fuel plants. You need every source of power generation that you've already got, and you wanna build more, and you wanna build something that's secure, simple, and cheap, right? And that generally means fossil fuels. And coal is the simplest, the most secure, the most widely available, and among the cheapest sources. And it's a baseload source of 24-7 power. Part of the reason why conventional energy systems are so dominant and so difficult to remove is because they're easy to use and you get a lot of benefit from them. And I think that this is fundamentally the debate for the whole energy transition conversation anyway, because we know that we can alleviate energy poverty by going into places that have access to resources like coal and help them to figure out the best way to use it and we can have immediate impact. But if we only want them to use things that we think are better, but are actually more expensive, or that are not fully developed, or that require more capacity for management, then I don't think we're improving energy poverty. The challenge for policymakers is to devise a policy framework that enables energy security, environmental sustainability, and affordability and access, while keeping in mind that capabilities in developed countries far outpace capabilities in developing nations. So what may work here may not necessarily be transposable in other economies. So taking into account the local characteristics and the subdomains, like the geopolitical factors, the environmental, social, and cultural aspects will greatly improve an uptake of a particular technology or a sustainable solution. For the energy transition to be successful, it'll take collective action across the energy system. Our modern world depends on oil and gas. I mean, we use them for things like transportation, to heat and cool our homes, they are in many of our consumer products that we use every single day. So it's not just a simple matter of stopping the production of oil and gas, but society at the same time needs to transition to a net zero emissions world from lifestyle choices by consumers to government policies that incentivize decarbonization to businesses that demonstrate a commercial case for lower carbon products and technologies. There must be growth, I think, in the distributed energy systems for our homes, for our businesses, things like rooftop solar or wind turbines to create our own power while using batteries that store excess supply. Of course, as an energy system, we will still have to address some sectors that can't be electrified. For example, 
commercial aviation, heavy duty trucking and shipping. The solutions may include LNG for some, or maybe hydrogen, or advanced low carbon biofuels for others. For heavy industrial processes, such as the making of steel and cement, I actually think the most realistic solution there is around carbon capture and storage, but the world actually needs to ramp that up pretty quickly. To achieve a net zero emissions world, we will have to reverse deforestation. By planting more trees, we can help the planet manage the remaining CO2 emissions that come from things like agriculture and heavy industry and other sectors that are really difficult to decarbonize. So for better or worse, really the U.S has to lead the way in this. I mean, we're the largest source of historic emissions. We're the second largest source of current emissions. We've got the largest economy and the most wherewithal for this. And, you know, like it or not, uh, countries tend to follow our lead on, on policy making. So we need to lead by example, and also through technological help and, and even financial help in some cases. It's going to take time for public policy and regulatory approaches to develop in a way that can support technology development and expansion. And we can look at our past experience with consumer protection, regulatory oversight of industries, safety issues, food, pharmaceuticals, all of these things have taken decades. The pressures that societies are mounting on clean energy are profound, larger than they ever have been before. It's incredibly important that everybody really get a good handle on the depth of the problem. Reality, data, the legacies of existing infrastructures, the technologies that are required to adequately address the concerns that are being raised. So it's important that we continue to try to educate and elevate the conversation. Innovation will ultimately drive change. In 50 years from now, the world will look very different than it does today. The bottom line is this, I think society must both enhance access to energy and get to a net zero emissions future. I think that's going to be really challenging. It will require unprecedented collaboration between all segments of society. More and more we're seeing evidence of the will to work together, so I'm pretty encouraged that society is going to find a way to work collaboratively across sectors and across the board. As we go forward, I think it's important that we take the reins off allow the education system to flourish, expand opportunities to everybody, because demographics, economic status, really has no bearing on how smart an individual is or whether or not they're creative. And tackling problems like this really does come down to creativity and creative solutions. We have to keep that kind of a mindset, that kind of eye on the prize, if you will. Because if we don't, we will continue to affect solutions that are very short-term in nature and ultimately only result in band-aids and don't address structurally what the real issue is.